Hello, Ida. Thank you for joining us for another edition of 21 Minutes with KKB. My name is Kobna Chenchen Ibati. I'm grateful for your time today, as always. Now, today, I speak to a gentleman who was responsible for managing the National Health Insurance Scheme. A gentleman who now wants to be president of Ghana, of course. He wants to start with the mantle of leadership in his party, the National Democratic Congress. I return in a jiffy to introduce my guest for today. Stay with us. Sylvester Mensa was Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Insurance Authority for six years. He's left that position. Now, he wants to be President of Ghana, but of course, he wants to start with flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress. He's my guest for today. Sly, good morning and many thanks for uh, inviting us to your home today for this very interview. Thank you. My hope pleasure. you're well. I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> I'm sure in the in the past few days you've not been yourself. You've not been very happy with the fact that uh, your former boss says, "Well, he's going to contest." Are you okay oh, with that? Oh, not really. Not really. It's an open contest. I always keep an open mind, mm. and uh, uh, I don't usually fall for surprises. And so, yes, we had the the announcement, uh, and. Uh, we welcome him to the contest. I think it's a democratic... No, but, but was it really a surprise? No, really. You it saw was, it coming? Yeah, it wasn't a surprise. Mm. Uh, well, I had intel that he would be contesting. Okay. But again, uh, the supposed unity walk mm -hmm. was a clear manifestation that he was going to contest. You call and it uh, a supposed unity walk? Yes, supposed unity walk. You know, I've not hidden my impressions and uh, perception about the, the supposed unity walk. There was nothing unity about it. It was uh, an arrangement to relaunch a, a, a kind of, a, for lack of a better word, to relaunch a comeback. And uh, I saw it just as it is, and uh, I'm not wrong about it. So there are several people who have joined these unity walks, uh, people who are all in favor of a comeback for John Dramani Mahama? Not really. When I organize a walk today, the numbers will be huge. We organize a walk in Accra. It was, it's been the largest of all the walks, and... Uh, uh, was it also a unity walk? No, that wasn't a unity what walk. What was that? It was in commemoration of uh, the Kwame Nkrumah's birthday. Okay. The birthday of the first president of the Republic of Ghana. And it was huge. And so, of course, if you organize any walk today, you expect to find our members coming uh, in their numbers. You're not very perturbed by the fact that Mahama, John Romani Mahama, a former president of the Republic, is contesting for the flag bearership position, or so you say. Uh, what gives you so much confidence? Why are you a better candidate? Well, it's not about what gives so much confidence. It's about the passion to undertake a task. You were part of his government. You served as chief executive officer of the National Health Insurance Authority. Well, of course, that was a very influential uh, position to hold in his party, uh, in his government, of course. If you didn't believe in his style of leadership, why then did you stick around all, all that while? Six years. I, I'm not sure the issue is about not believing in someone. I was appointed, first of all, mm. to correct that narrative. I okay. was appointed by the late president, Professor Jones, uh, 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 I mean, Johnny Johnny Vance Vance Mills. and uh, uh, my tenure ran into uh, 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 his tenure. And of course, uh, I served under him, and I'm very proud to have served under him. But you would also observe that in government, you don't do everything. You are given your side of the corner, and you shine your corner. What's your take on the former president's, um, that's John Dramani Mama, his tenure as president? How do you rate it? How do you value it? Well, I think that there are, there are several aspects of the... Was he a good leader? There are several aspects of the political product. Was John Mahama a good leader? Uh, uh, former president John Dramani Mahama was not a bad leader. Was uh, he a good leader? I've, in the, I've answered you. I said he was not a bad leader. But was he a good leader? He was not a bad leader. Why do you still want to press on this? I've responded to your question. He wasn't a bad leader, at least in terms of performance. If we have the soft factors and the hard factors, and if you need both soft and hard factors to, as it were, deliver value to the people, that would inure to the benefit of the party and translate into electoral votes, perhaps 
he did exceedingly well as far as the hard factors are concerned, that is infrastructure. So far, no government in the history of the NDC or the history of Ghana mm -hmm. can, can match the level of infrastructure development under his leadership. And uh, everybody who observes what was done over the period cannot but applaud. And so in terms of infrastructure, I think that we were perfect. But I guess the soft aspect of, uh, of delivery, of governance, that relates largely to policies and uh, which reflect in terms of uh, employment and uh, money in the pocket and a few others, uh, perhaps we could have done much better. You described some of the things he did as um, legendary, if I should use that word. Uh, some time back, you're quoted as saying that um, the things we've seen Muhammad do, his achievements, are so huge, the only person we can compare him to is Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, someone who is revered in the country. In the same breath, you sit and criticize him and make it look as though he was a beast or he was a demon, someone who came to tear everything apart. Are you not being a hypocrite? The, the, the issue goes beyond that. Okay. I believe strongly that he has done his part. His name has gone into the history of this country as one whose performance in terms of infrastructure is unmatched. Uh, but we also need to appreciate that in, in politics, what we do is to market a political product. And so if you even have what you consider as your best product, I mean, let's go into business terms. You are a manufacturer, you have developed your best product. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, packaging, in terms of functionality, you think that you have the best product, you put the product on the market, and the market rejects your product. You don't go back and rebrand your product to the same market. Perhaps the market is looking at the functionality. Or perhaps the, your I marketing mean, strategy was not good enough. The market, I mean, well, I mean, you and I know mm. that he's the most marketed person in this country. Uh, it's and about so, the strategy. And so, it's about how you marketed and so, him. And so the whole idea is what level of the product is challenged. Is he not your most credible threat in this contest? Of course, he's certainly the most credible threat. But at the end of the day, we must avoid personalizing some of these questions. What's I your trump card? What is that one message you're selling to the delegates to choose you over John Mahama, over Joshua Alabi, over um, all the other contenders? Well, I have a vision that is anchored one on my belief in our common humanity to that we need to give power back to the people of this country the electorate mm. three mutual respect and four returning to our core values of probity and accountability one of the things i've heard some of your critics say is that it's like he's a young guy he just came wow mm. he just came and all of a sudden you want to be president yeah i think most people just came and uh, they don't take their time to read the history of the party i have been part of the formation of the party i did not join the party i'm sure you've heard some of the aspirants mm -hmm. indicating when they joined the party i had never joined i was part of the formation of the party i was the first regional youth organizer of the party that led in the creation of the constituencies we have in some parts of the country, yeah. particularly in the greater Accra region. I then became the regional secretary two years after for uh, over seven years. As we speak today, I am the chairman of the regional finance committee of the party. I also serve on the council of elders of the party in the region. And you know, I was the uh, uh, coordinator, the regional coordinator of the campaign, the campaign. for the uh, uh, largest region in the country, the Greater Accra region. And so if people take their time to understand others. Besides, I'm 54. I mean, if I was working in the public service, I have six years to retire, and I'm still young. It's strange, but uh, perhaps my looks, I'm, I may be too handsome for my age, <laughs> but it's all because I take good care of my health. I exercise, do a lot of work, and uh, I'm quite particular about my health. I mean, uh, w one of the things a lot of people have said is that, well, we took a risk with a young president and uh, we didn't get the outcome we wanted. That's what a lot of people have said. Why should we take another risk with an even younger person, yeah, I which think, is you? Yeah, I think that calculation is also wrong. Uh, the young president they are referring to became vice president at age 51. 
or less mm -hmm. and uh, eventually became president at around 54 55 i'm 54 now and so by 2020 i should be around 57 and so in terms of young 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 i've gone past the argument of young at 57 i'm no more young is there even any relevance in that very argument of someone being young or someone being too old to govern i think that we need to change our mindset our constitution provides that you can only be president one of the key criteria is age yeah. you must be 40 years and above mm -hmm. i think that the world has moved beyond that we know of uh, presidents who assume office at age 39 we know of france uh, macron at uh, 39 and there are other younger presidents who have emerged some at 38 others at 37 and these are countries that are more advanced than Ghana these are countries that are far more sophisticated than Ghana these are countries that manage far more resources than we do these are countries with a, a bigger GDP than Ghana and with more educated and sophisticated people I mean so that argument has become a little uh, 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 bankrupt perhaps but of course we are also emerging from a culture that is evolving and uh, it's also very quick for people to dismiss others using age as a factor uh, I believe that the young people of this country must be given the opportunity mm. in any case our st data statistics provide that all those who are 40 years and below exceed 60 percent of of, 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 of of our population mm. and so if that is the case then perhaps we need to be looking if it, then i may be too old at <laughs> at 54 now going into 57 by 2020 i may be i may even be too old and so we need to disabuse our minds of that we have young people who are very sharp sharper than uh, us we have young people who are far more educated and brighter than we are we have young people who are better exposed than we are and i guess it would be an insult to continue emphasizing on uh, mm. age as a basis for leadership i think that statecraft has become rather sophisticated and uh, we need younger people in position i want to believe that by by the end of 2028 20, it will be absurd for me to get up and say i want to be president i'm sure by which time my age would have been a major factor so you don't agree to the suggestion that the youth particularly they need grooming a lot of people have suggested so even one of uh, the people contesting this very flag bearer positions has suggested that we need to groom young people so that they can take up leadership positions you don't share in that ideology well i believe i believe in grooming but uh, grooming has various uh, approaches it could be self-grooming it could be under a mentorship and what have you but again a youth who is ready is ready and uh, what it means is that one would have gone through self-grooming, through uh, learning and uh, learning the experiences of others or having a mentorship. So yes, uh, even the elderly need grooming. Everyone needs grooming. A journalist needs grooming. So who is that one person grooming you to be president? Well, I have been undertaking a number of self-grooming arrangements. You're, you're grooming yourself? I've been, I've, in several fronts, I've been undertaking self-grooming arrangements and uh, I have a number of mentors, uh, not one, I have several mentors. When it comes to public speaking, I have a mentor. When it comes to management, I have a mentor. I'm asking when who is grooming to you to be president of Ghana? I have several people, so I wouldn't be able to mention one name. Who are the people grooming you to be president of the Republic? I don't want to go public on they, that. They do not want to be named? I don't think that it would be fair on my part they to are just name them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go public on that. There's information to suggest you met the Ahoys and some other senior uh, members of your party in the month of, um, we are in May, right? So in the month of April, you met some senior members of your party to get them to speak to John Mahama. That, you know what, um, I'm ready to partner him as vice president or as running mate. So just talk to him and then I'll back down. Is that a case? How that, accurate is that information? That has never happened. It's never crossed my mind. You've never it met has, a section has, of it has never happened. a section of party leaders no, to, has, to pitch happened. to them that you are ready and willing to it succumb has, or has, surrender if and only if John Mahama will reserve the number two slot for you. 
I think that's someone's imagination. I've never had any such discussion, and no one has broached any such issue uh, uh, with me. So you wouldn't want to be vice president if given the opportunity? Of course, if you are gunning for number one. The second best option, if you fail in grabbing number one, is number two. Is okay. the position of president not too big for you? Or at least that's what some of uh, your critics have said, that yes, you're a fine gentleman. Yes, you have a lot of prospects. Yes, it appears you can do a good job. But is the position just not too big for you? In terms of age, in terms of uh, uh, experience, in terms of... Are you not of, shooting above of, your abilities? In terms of uh, capacity, in terms of... Uh, 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 knowledge, academic background, I don't, what criteria are you using? Because we have had presidents who have been younger than I am, two who have been less educated than I am, three who have been less experienced than I am, and so that argument too doesn't sit well. Let's take a look at what you did at NHIA. And for six years, you run that institution for us. Some say the, the four governments left you something good. You came, you ran it for six years, came in with several policies, including a one-time premium thing, and then eventually you collapsed the scheme. Is that the case? So, uh, politics has a way of uh, misinforming and disinforming all for political mileage. Mm. Uh, no technical person, whether within the Health Insurance Authority or within the industry of uh, health insurance globally would make that statement of uh, uh, collapsing the health insurance scheme. It is acknowledged that the scheme that we uh, took over in 2009 mm -hmm. has been improved tremendously. We have deepened the scheme far beyond what we met in terms of structure, in terms of systems, in terms of policy, in terms of strategy, in terms of operations, in terms of administration and management, the scheme has been moved to a completely different level. We changed the existing enrollment arrangement, ID cards, manual ID cards, where you register and it takes nine months, 12 months to receive your card, to an instant ID, biometric ID card, where you get your card instantly. It could take seven minutes. It could take 20 See, minutes. See, some say, oh, this and, is uh, all talk. The reality on the ground is that if you're holding an NHIS card and you enter a hospital, you, you will not get the service you, are, you require yeah, the, at that very point. If, I'll, I'll respond to that. We, we are having service providers march onto the streets and protest some cut-off service to hospitals and the like. And you're saying that, of course, you've, you've said all the good things, but on ground, yeah, it's not reflected. That is not to say that everything is well. Mm -hmm. The real challenge with the health insurance scheme has to do with funding. Okay. In a situation where you grew the scheme, you inherited a scheme with about... Uh, 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 an active membership of less than 4 million and you grow active members, uh, membership beyond 11 million, a scheme with utilization of uh, less than 8 million and utilization rises to above uh, 29 million. The increasing numbers is an indication of increasing public confidence in the scheme, which also has implications for funding. And so, yes, we left some debt. It is not shameful. You left a lot of debt, we not let, some debt. We let, we, we, well, we left some debt. And uh, it is not shameful to say that we left some debt. So what from that so, suggestion of a one-time premium? And you kept insisting that it's sustainable, it will yeah, work. But I, I think that the one-time premium is an issue that should have been dead and buried by now. I'm surprised you have raised one-time premium. But I'll take advantage to explain this to you mm -hmm. in just a minute. One-time premium was... Uh, a, 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 a campaign proposal for the NDC. So because you which, promised you had to which, deliver. Which entered our manifesto, and so we had a responsibility to deliver on our mandate. Did you know at, at the uh, point, at the point, me, at the point this was being issued, did you know that it was going to fail? Um, that policy was, was dead on arrival. Well, let me put it in a better way. That the NDC was determined to implement the policy our stakeholders and subscribers were against the policy and government being a listening government ordered the uh, 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 an emergency stakeholder meeting between the ministry of health the health insurance authority and internal and external stakeholders to deliberate on the issue of the one-time premium payment policy mm -hmm. the stakeholder conference came out with a communique to the effect that one-time premium should be set aside 
there was a communique that was issued. His Excellency President John Dramani Mahama was at the closing ceremony. The communique was read and handed over to him that stakeholders are not interested in one time. So you didn't do your due diligence so before going around telling everybody so that, you know what, we, <laughs> you vote for us and we'll offer you one time premium. Just pay once, you don't have to pay again. You didn't do due diligence, you just told us what you wanted to hear. Is that the case? Well, let me say that pa political parties are always looking at the best way to, as it were, satisfy the people or generate policies. So it was just a way to win votes? Not necessarily so. It was, it was way, one of the ways was, to win it was, votes. It was a way of uh, uh, deepening health insurance and the financial risk protection. But perhaps it was too deep uh, 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 in the sense that the cost implications did not immediately come to mind. So you agree that now that it was a useless proposition well, that, at that, the time? That is your opinion. No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. I do you mean, agree now I, that it was a useless proposition at the time? It is your opinion. I won't stop you. How do you suggest, of course, and having run this institution before, what do you think would be the best way to sustain the scheme? Well, I'm glad you've asked this question. I was invited by government, by the current the minister, government? Yeah, okay. to uh, an emergency stakeholder meeting as a resource person. Okay. And uh, I provided a few ideas on the way forward. But mind you, before we left office, we had also commissioned uh, a team to review the structure of the scheme to, as it were, address the challenges that the scheme was facing. So one, armed with my experience in handling the scheme for six years, and two, having read the entire report of the committee, I was well prepared for such a meeting. And mm. indeed, most of the issues were not new because we had shared similar ideas with various countries that have consulted us on wanting to set up health So what's the schemes. best way forward? Now, when you're going to the market mm -hmm. to, to, to shop, the first thing you do is to put some money in your pocket. Of course. It is on the basis of what you have in your pocket that you fill your basket. Mm -hmm. Okay? What I'm saying simply is that the benefit package of the health insurance scheme requires some, 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 some reference to available resources. We have a very generous benefit package addressing almost 95% of disease burden for a country like Ghana. Mm. The benefit package is too huge. And we started right from the outset with a huge benefit package. I think that what we need to do is to rationalize the benefit package, redefine primary health care as a country, and limit the package to primary health care. That is one. Two. We also need to look at the exemption regime. Almost 69 to 70% of all enrollees are exempt from paying premium, even though the premium is low. You have pregnant women or expectant mothers who are exempted from paying premium. You have all those 18 years and below who are exempted from paying premium. You have the aged, 70 years and above, exempt from paying premium. You have the poor, the, and the, 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 the poor, the, the, not, the, no, the no haves, I mean those mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the marginalized and uh, the indigents exempt from paying premium and then you also have the differently abled or disabled exempt from paying premium and then you have the uh, mental patients also exempt from paying premium so generally you have a wide range of exemption what we need to do to inject equity in the scheme is to review the exemption regime so in, in, a, in a future NDC government with probably you as president or vice president or holding any other public office, you would advocate that uh, a lot more people are required to pay for the service. Uh, what we will do is to ensure that those who have the ability to pay, pay. Of course, your son, my son, should not be exempt from paying premium mm. because he's 12 or 13 years. We have the ability to pay. And so why should we be exempted? And so those who are capable of paying must not be enrolled in the blanket case of exemption. It does not ensure equity. It undermines the whole idea of uh, reducing social exclusion. Pregnant women, for instance, someone drives in a Mercedes, gets to the hospital, and for the simple fact that she's pregnant, she's exempt from paying, I think that it is not fair. 
those who can pay must be allowed to pay. Your assets it. were frozen sometime in, was it January 2017 or 2016? It was in 2016. 2016? Yes. You were still in power then? Yes, we were in power. Why? What happened? Well, I, I, I'm still looking for answers because uh, there were no monies in those accounts. And, uh, and that was the Mahama government? Yes, yes, yes. There were no monies in, in those accounts. And there were not accounts that uh, other funds have, uh, as it were, passed through. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm as curious as, 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 as you are. So but, what, but what I, happened that day? You were just arrested and then what? Well, I, was, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't arrested. Okay. I was invited b uh, on phone and uh, I, I, I walked there myself and uh, I was subjected to some interrogation. I believe that uh, some, some accusations and uh, suspicions and... Uh, I wouldn't call it mischief because when you're in public office, you must agree that using and uh, supervising and superintending over the taxpayers' money, uh, it is not wrong to be asked to account for your stewardship. And so I didn't take it as something that. Some say John Mahama saw you as a threat back then, so he had to do this just to tarnish your reputation. Well, I'm sure when you engage him and you ask him, he may be able to tell you exactly uh, whether what you are saying is valid or not. I have no reason to believe and I have no reason to disbelieve. But what I understand is that when you're in public office, you must be ready to subject yourself. Do you to see it as machinations from someone who saw you as a threat? Well, I see it as something rather useful. Useful in the sense that perhaps I'm one of the very few who has gone through a public inquiry and uh, have uh, come out unscratched. At the end of the day, uh, I had a letter indicating that the investigations were over and that there has been no adverse finding. That letter, I guess, is a very useful testimony. Uh, beyond that, my accounts were frozen and the uh, authorities, the BNI and the rest, had to write formally to the courts and to tell the courts that there has been no adverse findings and that my accounts are being released. I feel very relieved and I think that uh, there's no other way of uh, telling the public that you are one of the clean people who can be relied upon in leading this party. Some of the contestants have reason to believe that they are not being treated fairly with the way and manner in which the, a lot of people seem to be doing things and saying things to back one candidate over the other and that they think it's not a level playing field. You also feel the same? Well, I think that uh, some some members of the National Executive Committee, and in particular the organizer, uh, uh, my very good friend, Kofi Adams, Kofi Adams mm. seems to have lost it completely. He has lost the understanding that he is supposed to be an unbiased uh, arbiter in this whole exercise, because the national organizer by our constitution is the chief field operator and has a very key role to play in a contest of this nature. You cannot have a contest where, where the arbiter openly and clearly declares a position or a stand for a competitor. I mean, it's, it's below the belt. Mm. And one would expect that the party would, as it were, uh, call him to order. But unfortunately, that has not been done. And he continues... Any reason why you think that has not been done? As, 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 as it stands today, we have too many sycophants in the party who refuse to see the wrong thing. And uh, those are some of the negativities we need to eradicate from the party. We need to reorient our party members. We need to get back to our values of probity and accountability. We need, as, as it were, uh, uh, principled loyalty in our party. People must operate within defined remit and to allow for an evil, I mean, a, a level playing field and to ensure that all concerns as we get to the primaries are dealt with in order to ensure that we have peace and harmony in our party after the elections. At the end mm. of the day, only one person is going to emerge. I believe strongly I'm going to emerge as the next flag bearer. But in the unlikely event that another emerges, we would urge all party members to rally behind the candidate and win the 2020 elections. Mm. 
We wish you well, Sylvester Mensa. Thank you very and much. And I've enjoyed this conversation with Thank you. you. Thank Sylvester you. Mensa uh, is former Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Insurance Authority. He's been, uh, he's held that position for six years while he left and now he wants to be president of the republic he's had a very interesting conversation with us and one key thing i picked from what he says is that there are too many sicko fans in the ndc <laughs> i hope to hear the, the the comments that follow that very claim of his but it's been another edition of 21 minutes with kkb my name is kwabna chenche i'll see you soon hopefully with another guest you're expecting